Okay, thank you, and um, thank you for accommodating uh, the panel having a short break. So, um, carrying on with uh, the session, uh, our next speaker is uh, Thierry uh, Chapuis, uh, who is uh, the president of France Gas Maritime uh, since uh, the middle of 2022 and uh, deputy director at GRDF uh, since uh, October. Um, but for the previous uh, six years, he was general manager of the French Gas Association, which was renamed France Gas during his mandate. And he has overall more than 30 years of experience in the energy world, having joined Gas de France in 1996. Over to you, Thierry. Thank you, Tim. Euh, alors, je, je vais faire ma présentation en français euh, parce que je passe plus facilement les messages, mais aussi parce que comme ça, ça vous fera une langue différente. Parce que vous allez voir que le, le message est assez similaire à, à ce qui a été donné par Steve, même s'il si y a quelques, quelques variantes. Euh, voilà. euh, donc, peut-être je commence par euh, juste présenter France Gaz Maritime. France Gaz Maritime, c'est l'association française qui... Euh, qui, euh, dont, dont l'objectif, c'est de, de faire euh, bah, la, la promotion de toutes les solutions gaz. Euh, donc euh, le GNL en fait partie, euh, les, euh, les, 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 le bio-GNL, euh, les IGNL, mais aussi le méthanol, euh, etc. Donc on regarde l'ensemble des, des solutions avec, euh, en essayant d'avoir une, une vue la plus, euh, une expertise la plus forte possible. Euh, évidemment, on s'inscrit de, de façon très forte dans la transition énergétique. Euh, ce ce qu'on... Donc, le, comme euh, vous le savez, l'industrie, le, 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 euh, je dirais, du, du shipping s'inscrit clairement dans l'objectif dans de, de la neutralité carbone. Euh, C'est un truc qui, est, qui va être très difficile, complexe, euh, beaucoup d'incertitudes. Euh, je dirais, le, le chemin, il est, il est, euh, voilà, il est compliqué. Euh, il y a plusieurs euh, choses à, à faire. On, on va, je, je vais en parler assez longuement sur le, les différents carburants. Euh, mais il y a aussi tout un, un, un secteur régulatoire euh, qui est indispensable. On ne fera pas la neutralité carbone sans avoir, euh, je dirais, une régulation forte et des incisations. Parce que, parce que sinon, je dirais, les, les prix euh, des carburants fossiles font qu'on euh, ne sera pas incité à le faire. Et voilà. Euh, le chemin, il est aussi compliqué. Il y a beaucoup d'incertitudes, beaucoup d'innovations à faire. Euh, les solutions qu'on a euh, aujourd'hui, elles ne sont pas les solutions qu'on aura en 2050. Ou au moins, on ne les a pas toutes euh, inventées. C'est tout ça qu'on euh, qui, qu essaye de regarder euh, côté France Gaz Maritime. Euh, ce que je n'ai pas dit, c'est que France Gaz Maritime, on, on réunit dans un même cercle les énergéticiens, euh, les, les ports et les armateurs. Donc, je dirais ceux qui produisent euh, l'énergie, euh, ceux qui, euh, je dirais, accueillent les bateaux et puis ceux qui, ceux qui, ceux qui arment les bateaux. Voilà, ce qui nous donne une, une vue, euh, je dirais, assez générale. Euh, et ce, que, de, ce dont je vais parler, c'est évidemment la version française. Euh, donc, je dis, le, le message est assez proche de, de, de message que, que vient de donner Steve. Donc je commence peut-être par... Et donc ça, c'est le, le graphe, il était, le, je pense que c'est le même. Euh, c'est peut-être pas le même graphe, mais c'est la même source. Euh, je pense que c'est le, le nombre de bateaux euh, au GNL dans le monde, à peu près 1000 euh, bateaux au GNL. Euh, donc c'est un, un, une croissance très importante. Aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas la totalité, euh, encore une fois. Euh, si on regarde ça en tonnes transportées... Euh, c'est presque la moitié des tonnes transportées dans le, dans le carnet de commandes qui est au GNL. Euh, donc, c'est des volumes qui sont quand même euh, très importants. Euh, voilà. euh, le, le méthanol arrive un petit peu avec quelques... On l'a vu d'ailleurs dans la table ronde ce matin euh, avec quelques bateaux commandés. C'est souvent des, des, des bateaux un peu plus petits, pas toujours pour le méthanol. Euh, et en tout cas, pour l'ammoniaque et l'hydrogène, euh, c'est des, des chiffres beaucoup plus petits et des bateaux aussi beaucoup plus petits euh, à la fois en tonnes transportées et en, et en taille. Euh, alors, côté France Gaz Maritime, on a beaucoup travaillé. Euh, on n'était pas les seuls euh, avec euh, donc, euh, Evolène en particulier euh, pour, je dirais, aider euh, à construire la feuille de route de décarbonation du maritime. Euh, alors, évidemment, les solutions euh, que nous, on apportait ne sont pas les seules. 
euh, pour décarboner le maritime, il y a aussi tout, mais je dirais, ce n'est pas, pas l'expertise de, de France Gaz Maritime. Euh, il y a aussi bah, toutes les solutions de réduction de la vitesse, euh, de, du VLIC, euh, etc., euh, dont on, qui, qui font partie de cette feuille de route. Et nous, on a, par, on a regardé la partie, euh, je dirais, la partie gaz et la partie, euh, euh, je dirais, infrastructure et la partie aussi euh, carburation. Et voilà. Ce qu'on qu voit, euh, c'est que... Euh, euh, je dirais la France s'inscrit clairement dans cette euh, neutralité carbone. Euh, on va voir le, la feuille de route et les, les résultats de la feuille de route, euh, le slide d'après. Euh, euh, je dirais le, le message, les, les, les biocarburants euh, ont clairement un, un temps d'avance dans cette euh, aujourd'hui, dans cette, dans cette feuille de route sur les, les autres, je dirais, euh, carburants euh, décarbonés. Euh, le rôle important du GNL euh, arrive de façon assez flagrante euh, surtout au, dé, au début de la, de la, de la transition, euh, qu'on qu a une, euh, je dirais une arrivée des e-carburants, euh, mais qui sera sans doute plus difficile euh, à plus long terme, euh, mais qui, en, en tout cas, qu'on ne peut pas... Euh, euh, voilà, que, que, qui, qui arrive quand même, euh, je dirais, relativement vite et presque plus, plus vite que ce qu'on qu pensait au départ. Euh, voilà, le, le méthanol, euh, euh, des questions euh, sur l'hydrogène et l'électricité. Euh, la vraie question, c'est euh, la disponibilité, tant de l'hydrogène que de l'électricité. Euh, à partir du moment où l'une et l'autre seront disponibles, euh, je dirais, le, les choses peuvent se dérouler. Il euh, y a quand même une vraie question derrière ça. Euh, alors là, vous avez les résultats de la, la feuille de route euh, française du maritime. Euh, donc vous voyez, le, ben on démarre en, en, en 2022, enfin là, il y a quelques l'année dernière, euh, avec euh, une part de, je dirais de, de, de fossiles qui est évidemment très importante, hein, euh, quasiment, euh, quasiment exclusivement. Euh, et puis on arrive euh, en 2050 euh, avec une, je dirais le, ce, qui, ce qui se voit le plus, c'est la partie e-carburant. Euh, donc avec une, un volume de e-carburant très important. Euh, vous voyez que là-dedans aussi, toute la partie biocarburant, qui est la partie verte, euh, a une croissance assez forte euh, et puis ensuite euh, décroît un peu. Euh, C'est la, la feuille de route française du maritime. Euh, si, vous, si je vous donne l'avis de France Gaz euh, Maritime là-dedans, c'est sans doute que je dirais l'intersection entre le, la, la, la zone verte et la zone rouge euh, pose question. Euh, Est-ce qu'elle sera exactement ce qu'elle est ou elle sera sans doute un peu plus tardive C'est bien probable et que la zone rouge, elle arrive, mais elle arrive un peu plus tard. Ça, ça dépendra, c'est ce que je disais, ça dépendra de la disponibilité euh, de, de l'électricité et de l'hydrogène, pas seulement au niveau français, mais au niveau mondial. Euh, voilà, pour que euh, ça ait été un peu évoqué par le, mes, mes prédécesseurs, euh, pour faire des e-carburants, c'est des quantités très importante d'électricité. Euh, donc là, pour faire cette feuille de route, c'est l'équivalent de 7 réacteurs nucléaires qu'il faudrait juste pour le maritime. Voilà, sachant que ben, on en a prévu euh, 6 plus, enfin 14, euh, et qui sont euh, en 2050, euh, on espère qu'ils sera, ils seront, ils seront tous construits, mais ils vont juste commencer. Et donc euh, clairement, les, les volumes sont bien plus, voilà, ils, ils correspondent pas. D'ailleurs, euh, la DGEC l'exprime le, bien quand on prend l'ensemble des feuilles de route ça ne matche pas encore complètement. Pour autant, c'est important d'avoir cette, cette feuille de route en, en ligne de mire. Et c'est vrai qu'on a beaucoup, nous, beaucoup œuvré pour que l'ensemble de nos solutions soient entendues. Et, pour que, et, et je pense qu'elle a... Euh, voilà, on a beaucoup travaillé là-dessus. Euh, le, le premier point, donc, si on, si on le fait dans l'ordre... Euh, après le, le, le GNL, ce qui va arriver, c'est des, des, du bio, enfin des, des biométhanes ou du bio GNL. Euh, Aujourd'hui, en France, alors la production elle est de 8,5, la capacité de production elle est de 12 TWh. C'est parce qu'il y a 600, aujourd'hui 600, un peu plus de 600 méthaniseurs qui existent. Euh, donc, euh, j'ai une capacité qui est en gros l'équivalent de deux réacteurs nucléaires, parce que tout à l'heure, j'ai ai dit qu'il en faudrait sept. On en a déjà deux en, en biométhane. Ils ne sont, euh, euh, sont pas tous faits pour le maritime, hein, évidemment. Euh, ce que nous, on pense dans le maritime, c'est qu'en 2030, si on veut faire 20% de, de, je dirais de, de décarbonation euh, avec le carburant, il faut à peu près 2 TWh euh, voilà, pour le maritime sur les, euh, en 2030, euh, sur la soixantaine euh, que prévoit la filière. 
Donc je dis à la fois beaucoup et pas beaucoup. Euh, Laurent en a parlé tout à l'heure. Euh, le potentiel en France, euh, euh, on le voit à 330 TWh. Arrivera-t-on à ce potentiel euh, Je dirais, voilà, le, au moins, on, on sait que le potentiel est là et il s'agit de, de le monter le plus vite possible. Euh, euh, Peut-être un point important, euh, c'est que euh, la, la logistique dans ces, dans ces e-carburants, la logistique est toujours un point clé. Euh, c'est vrai qu'on peut avoir les carburants, mais si on n'a pas euh, les moyens de transport, les moyens d'amener ça dans les bateaux, euh, à temps, euh, souvent en temps masqué, euh, parce que le, je dirais l'arrivée dans un port et le fait d'avoir un bateau qui reste dans le port, euh, ça coûte relativement cher. Donc tout, tous ces aspects logistiques euh, sont, sont importants. Et c'est vrai que euh, côté français, côté euh, industrie gazière française, euh, on voit ça comme euh, un, un gros avantage, le fait d'avoir euh, aujourd'hui euh, donc euh, cinq euh, en fait, quatre terminaux méthaniers plus un FSRU, mais donc cinq points d'entrée euh, en France du gaz, euh, ce qui fait qu'on a, on a cette logistique euh, qui, qui arrive et qui est assez forte. Euh, voilà. Et puis, euh, l'autre point, je ne vais pas euh, détailler tous les points, mais pour vous dire que euh, c'est vrai qu'on voit que le, les capacités de biométhane, la demande de l'industrie de euh, maritime, euh, elle est bien plus faible que la demande totale. Il euh, y a une vraie question d'ailleurs de, 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 soit d'allocation, soit de, de partage de, de cette quantité de biométhane. Euh, tout le monde en veut. Je pense que c'est plutôt une bonne chose. Je le vois plutôt comme une bonne chose, le fait que beaucoup de gens veuillent du biométhane que comme une contrainte. Euh, parce que ça veut dire que... Euh, euh, voilà, c est, c est, il a une certaine valeur parce que beaucoup de gens euh, en veulent donc euh, le transport maritime en veut le transport routier en veut, le bâtiment en veut et c'est bien euh, l'industrie voilà. en veut aussi beaucoup pour se décarboner au passage euh, sur, sur les euh, oui alors après euh, attendez excusez moi euh, je n'ai pas parlé tellement des, des, des e-carburants avant de, avant de faire ma conclusion, donc je me suis juste demandé si je n'avais pas... Un... Non, non, c'est bon. Euh, juste pour vous dire un, un, un point sur les sur e-carburants, les e je l'ai dit euh, clairement, pour avoir des e-carburants, il, euh, il faut avoir euh, de l'électricité ou du, ou du gaz. Ce qu'on pense aussi, c'est que euh, la partie e-carburant euh, enfin, nécessite d'abord d'avoir de, des... des euh, de l'électricité la plus propre possible. En France, euh, ça, ça tombe bien euh, parce que notre électricité, elle est, euh, je dirais, euh, relativement décarbonée, mais c'est un, un point important. Quand ça va être des carburants, euh, je dirais, à base de, du e-méthanol, par exemple, il va, il va aussi euh, falloir faire en sorte que, le, que ce e-méthanol soit aussi euh, bien décarboné au moment de sa production. Et donc, on a eu un très bon exemple euh, tout à l'heure. Euh, voilà. Euh, en, en, en conclusion, ce, ce qu'on pense, c'est que euh, ben nous, on voit un, un avenir assez fort d'abord au GNL. L'industrie, euh, je dirais, maritime est en train de passer aujourd'hui, euh, très franchement, du fuel lourd au GNL. Et c'est la première transition. Euh, la deuxième transition, elle se fera euh, du GNL avec progressivement de l'incorporation euh, de, de ce GNL, enfin, de l'incorporation de biogaz dans ce GNL et donc progressivement c'est ça qui va parce que l'infrastructure est là et parce que c'est relativement facile et puis euh, je dirais on va, on va être obligé d'attendre un, un peu de temps euh, par contre ce qui est important c'est que ce, ce peu de temps soit le plus, le plus court possible euh, à l'avenir d'autres solutions vont arriver euh, et, et tous les fuels en font partie je dirais le IGNL en fait partie aussi il ne sera qu'une partie de la, de la solution voilà, on aura, de la, on aura de, plutôt du méthanol euh, que de l'ammoniac. Euh, voilà. il, il, euh, il y a deux ans, on a sorti une étude assez importante euh, au niveau de France Gaz Maritime euh, sur euh, voilà, la Banque mondiale, pour, euh, je dirais, avait une vision euh, avec une, une, je dirais, des quantités d'ammoniac assez importantes. Euh, et c'est vrai qu'on a sorti une étude en se disant euh, on n'est pas complètement sûr euh, d'être euh, aussi optimiste euh, sur l'arrivée de l'ammoniac et euh, à la vitesse avec laquelle l'ammoniac va arriver. Euh, bon, on a, et pas, sont passés par là, euh, je dirais, plusieurs crises 
euh, dont, la, dont, le, dont la guerre en Ukraine, hein, qui a fait que quand même les, les prix ont tutoyé les sommets, euh, et, et, et passé par là aussi en France euh, la crise sur le la corrosion sous contrainte des, des réacteurs nucléaires, euh, ce qui fait que voilà, le, les choses sont beaucoup plus incertaines. Et en tout cas, le, le, mais il n'y a, a pas que pour cette raison, c'est aussi pour des raisons de logistique, comme je disais. Euh, L'avenir de l'ammoniac, la, euh, on, on le sent beaucoup plus éloigné. Il y a des problèmes aussi de, de sécurité euh, ou, de, ou de, de toxicité du, du produit. Voilà. Et donc, c'est plutôt, je dirais, dans les, dans les, dans les, dans les choses qu'on voit, c'est plutôt d'abord le méthanol, euh, je dirais après le, 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 le GNL et biométhane. Euh, voilà, je pense que j'ai à peu près tout dit. Euh, et puis je réinsiste sur le fait que, euh, je dirais, pour décarboner le maritime, euh, je dirais, les solutions gaz sont une partie de la solution. Elles ne sont qu'une partie de la solution. Euh, ce qui est important aussi euh, pour décarboner le maritime, euh, c'est d'avoir un panel euh, de ces solutions. Euh, et en particulier, euh, bah, je dirais, toutes les solutions. Euh, Vélique, de réduction de la vitesse, d'optimisation des routes euh, euh, feront aussi partie des solutions. Euh, et peut-être dernier point, euh, donc France Gaz Maritime, on s'occupe euh, de. Je dirais, on voit le, le, le gaz arriver euh, dans les grands ports. Il euh, y, y a trois autres points qui, sont, qui me semblent importants à évoquer. Euh, C'est, je dirais, les ports secondaires, enfin, dans les grands ports et, dans les, et sur les gros, avec les gros bateaux. Il y a trois points euh, importants, c'est les ports secondaires, je vais dire les bateaux de plus petite taille, et puis le fluvial. Voilà. Et ça, c'est un peu comme les, les i, euh, les i euh, carburants. Euh, le, le, je dirais les solutions gaz vont arriver dans ces trois endroits. Elles n'arrivent pas aujourd'hui. Euh, par contre, euh, on est certain qu'elles vont arriver demain. Euh, à, quel, à quelle échéance, on ne le sait pas encore, mais en tout cas, euh, ce qui est important, c'est aussi de préparer euh, ces endroits-là, euh, ce ne sera pas très dur demain quand on aura un shipper euh, euh, de faire la, la navette entre Marseille et Toulon euh, et de délivrer du GNL à Toulon. À partir du moment où il y a des clients qui arrivent, euh, voilà. et ce ne sera pas très dur de remonter la scène avec, euh, avec des, euh, des, euh, des péniches au GNL parce qu'on commence déjà à installer des, des stations. Euh, voilà. Et donc ça, c'est des, des choses sur lesquelles euh, on commence aussi à travailler euh, et dans lequel il y a de l'innovation, euh, je dirais, importante. Euh, voilà. Et donc, euh, côté France Gaz Maritime, on regarde aussi, même si ce n'est pas, euh, je dirais, le cœur euh, de la, la vraie transformation, enfin, ce n'est pas, pas que l'autre soit, soit fausse, mais de la transformation qui est, qui est vraiment la plus, la plus dynamique et qu'on observe le plus euh, aujourd'hui. Je ne crois plus que j'avais un... Voilà. Un... Donc, merci si vous avez des questions. Many thanks, Thierry, for that. Um, uh, good to hear the clarity from France Gas Maritime on the way forward. Um, are there questions uh, from the floor, please, for Thierry? Whilst you're thinking of your questions, I have one for you, Thierry. You, you had a graph there <coughs> showing the, uh, the rise of, of e-fuels uh, in the 2040s, becoming the dominant player. So what are the actions that we need to do now that will help? <coughs> yes, exactly, that one, the, the red part of the graph is showing, you know, um, becoming the dominant fuels in the 20 by 2050. So what actions do we need to do now to, to facilitate that? Uh, I would say f first action is to produce <laughs> all that e-fuels. So uh, we had a, a, a very good uh, example. Uh, with the, the, the e-methanol produce. So uh, that's the very first first uh, step. Second step will be to have all the infrastructure uh, to be able to deliver this uh, fuel uh, in, in the different uh, place where, in the, sh in the ship at the, at the end, but uh, in the port first and in the ship secondly. Uh, so it, it will probably take times Uh, for example, uh, when we start uh, the, the, the GNL uh, infrastructure, we start with, uh, with uh, filling uh, uh, ships with, with trucks. And then uh, in Marseille, for example, uh, Total decided to, to have uh, a ship de de dedicated to, uh, uh, um, to for, for that. So it's, 
we increase uh, slowly uh, the, the infrastructure and it's not possible to have a, a boat coming in Marseille uh, before having a, a source of uh, an important uh, way to, to, uh, to, to do the junction b between the terminal uh, of, of Faustanquin and, uh, and the, the harbor of, of Marseille. And we will have exactly the same, uh, I would say, issue and, and problem uh, and, uh, and solution <laughs> uh, with the, the, e, uh, the e stuff, uh, I would say. Sure, thank you. And um, uh, just to come on to a slightly different topic, which um, I guess is, is relevant for, for, for many of the you know, speakers here today, which is about, um, uh, we haven't really talked about the thinking about the wider impacts of, of methane. Um, um, so on ships, we've got um, you know, the need to make sure that um, the methane is controlled uh, from, from the engine, so we haven't got methane slip, as well as leaks, uh, because that can undo uh, the greenhouse gas benefits. Um, um, what is there from the infrastructure side, so from France Gas Maritime side, uh, that can help uh, ensure this? So the, the, the methane issue is uh, really a key issue for the gas industry. I, I would say it's ma many one of the main uh, 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 issue for, for the gas industry, so it's already taken in into account. Uh, for for uh, as far as maritime uh, is concerned, there is two points, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the, the, the methane uh, sl slip uh, from the infrastructure. It's, uh, I, I would say, it's, it's rather uh, slow today. Uh, we have, uh, I don't remember exactly the, the, the number, it's point, uh, 0.5 percent of the, of the gas which is, uh, which go to the atmosphere. Uh, we have two two um, two other problems. Uh, the first one is on the production of, of gas if it's fossil uh, fossil fuel uh, f fossil gas, uh, obviously. But uh, as you well, the, the idea is to to get rid of, of that. But still, we have to uh, to, uh, to to uh, to take care of th this issue. The second one is on on the on the boat uh, himself. Uh, so the, the, the uh, well, the methane slip on, on the boat. Uh, w that's an issue that uh, we are uh, looking at. Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, in uh, motorization, but I know that uh, uh, well, the, the the experts are uh, strongly in in pro uh, increasing uh, the. Uh, Which, um, increasing their efforts. Yeah, increasing the, yeah. the effort and and, and uh, uh, engaging to 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 to, uh, to decrease uh, the the amount of methane that that slip. Uh, but sorry, I'm not an expert in uh, in motors, so <laughs> I'm not able <laughs> to answer uh, exactly to to that, that question concerning the the, the, the ships uh, himself. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Thierry? Okay, uh, Steve would like to come in. Uh, so, uh, in just in regards to, to methane slip, I think as Thierry mentioned, it's a it is an it is an issue that's uh, recognised by the industry, um, but it. it really depends, and you have to contextualize this, it depends on the technology that you're talking about. So um, in the low pressure engines, which predom predominate in short sea shipping, uh, and particularly in, in the older technologies, um, there are significant levels of methane slip. But if you look at the order book, then uh, you at least half the order book is, um, consists of high pressure two stroke engines where effectively there is no methane slip. So the order book, the future is essentially one where at least half the engines have no methane slip. For those engines where low pressure technologies where methane slip is still an issue, um, that's being addressed rapidly. Um, so the industry is um, confident that by 2030 it won't be an issue for any, any engine technology. 
Um, a year or so ago, uh, a, a particular specific initiative was launched by the industry to address the issue of methane slip um, on board ships called MAMI. They've just finished their first year of operations where they've focused on measuring the issue. And now they're looking at um, abatement solutions, both for new builds and also for um, uh, retrofit to existing vessels. Thanks, Steve. That's really interesting to hear. There's a product to, to investigate that in real life. Be interested to hear the results. OK, I think we'll move on to our next speaker. Thierry, thank you very much for your, for your speech. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Laurent Amou, uh, who is the head of European and Institutional Affairs at LNG um, after 25 years uh, in the energy business. Um, LNG is an, a subsidiary of Angie. Uh, Laurent co-chairs several working groups within Gas Infrastructure Europe and France Gas, a part of CODIR of France Gas Maritime, uh, and is an active member of the New Energies uh, Coalition for Transport and Logistics. Laurent, over to you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So I'm going to speak uh, today about uh, regulation. That's my job. Uh, because I think uh, Red 3 is a real game changer that is offering uh, a very optimistic view for uh, the decarbonization of the shipping industry. <coughs> uh, first, why Red 3? There is other regulation. There is fuel EU, there is IMO, there is ETS, I've not even mentioned ETS here. But Red 3, in my view, is the most stringent one. We have uh, this morning a uh, presentation by team about uncertainty regarding IMO. Maybe IMO will kick back and become um, even more stringent. But for the time being, what we know is that we have a very strong signal by Red 3 which is minus 14.5% GHG reduction compared to minus 0.6 for fuel oil maritime. This is a huge discrepancy. This is exactly where the market will be driven. And um, Red 3, it's a directive, it's not a regulation. So contrary to fuel oil, it needs national transposition. And what's in is that national transposition is arriving or has already arrived uh, it has to be still extended in many European countries to the maritime sector. Uh, but this should happen quite quickly, 2026 for France, and this will completely change uh, the industry. So when we compare a bit the different regulation, this shift from fuel EU to red 3 is completely changing the market. It's a, a whole of a different world. Why? Uh, everything is different. It looks the same, but everything is different. In Red 3, the obliged party is a fuel supplier. So the one that will be in the driving seat are the fuel supplier. It's no more the shipping companies, contrary to fuel EU and IMO. Uh, the obligation based, it's completely different competition structure. With Red 3, the right level of competition is nations, is ports. Whether in Red 3, in a fuel oil maritime, the question is the competition between fleets. So that's really changing the market. And for IMO, we still don't know because there is, for the time being, it's by ship, which is, again, completely different. But there may be also a, a vo an exchange mechanism which could uh, bring it closer to fuel oil maritime. Uh, in terms of units, uh, we are in pure, for both fuel oil maritime and red three, we are purely in uh, intense uh, greenhouse gas intensity of the fuel. So whether the, the, the speed of the, uh, of the boat is changed or not, it does not change the requirement to change the fuel. So it's a really strong uh, incentive to change the fuel. For IMO, we still have to see whether it will be the same or whether there will be, like the CI today, uh, a dimension with uh, per uh, dead weight tonnage per kilometer, which obviously will be different. Eligible fuels, and that's also a, 
very different. Uh, in red three, of course, by definition, it's the red fuels that are recognized in red three. Fueling on maritime is excluding food and feed fuels, which represent a big chunk of the solution in red three. That's already a big, uh, a big difference. And a fueling in maritime, for the first time, has introduced, not completely clearly, but has opened the door for low carbon fuels that are certified uh, against the future rules on the future delegated act of uh, the future of the European uh, directives coming in. So that's really to see that the, s the market has been structured up to now and the decision, the project has been structured by Julio Maritime, that is to say by shipping companies that in reality had the time to invest because of the calendar of fuel maritime, now we will shift to a different world where it will be the fuel supplier that will have to invest, and they have to invest much quickly because the objective are much more stringent. So, we have this uh, minus 14.5 objective. How are we going to fill it? Uh, red three, and that's nearly a legal requirement is imposing a competition between fuel. So it will be a merit order story. The best fuel will emerge first, and only when this fuel will be completely used, then other fuel can emerge. And if I look at the merit order, first fuel, conventional biofuels that are exi already existing and produced, but that are capped. Uh, so they will represent part of the solution, but only a small part of the solution. Bio LNG, we, has, we have spoken a lot about bio LNG, and that's as it has been said before, it's very high in the merit order. It's probably the first fuel that will emerge and that will be used to uh, answer the requirements to fill uh, red three objectives. Then it's open. Whether it will be ELNG, emethanol, biomethanol, and when I say biomethanol, it seems that there is one technology, in fact, there is a whole range of technologies for all these fuels. Visibility is much less obvious on what will come next. Uh, what is at the very bottom of the process is advanced biodiesels or e-diesels. These are the most complex molecule to produce, and they are in strong competition with aviation. That will be the last. And Finally, low carbon fuels can emerge and can be introduced, can be valorized, but not in the 14.5 objective, so I will not speak of them today. So now, transposition the French system. That's really uh, good news for those who are believing in transition of the maritime sector. Uh, the system now has been voted with introduction of biomethane. It has been announced, also not yet written the law, that it will be extended to the maritime sector by 2026, which is quite early, uh, with an order of magnitude of the penalty. This figure will change again and again till 2026. I'm not worried about uh, creativity of, uh, and uh, adaptability of uh, French state on that subject. Uh, but it will be around these levels. Probably, in my view, it will be set by competition between different European countries. We are in a very competitive market. If you have a lower penalty in France than Germany, all the fuel will go to Germany. So there will, be, there will need to be a uh, quite level playing field between the different European systems sometimes in the future. When I give these figures, I am excluding the 1.2 multiplier that is uh, an option into the red directive and that is seriously considered currently. How does it work? Distributors is selling bio LNG at the pump or at the bunker vessel, I, I should have said. So he said when he sells bio LNG, he sells it at a price that is competitive with either LNG or a VLSFO, depending on how the, the market will, will stabilize but roughly at the price of a fossil fuel. 
and that will cover also all the infrastructure costs to deliver the fuel. Uh, then, on top of that, the distributor will sell this Tiruert certificate. At the pr this is a market system, so you, there is a, some level of risk behind that, but it should be close to the penalty. And the penalty is significant. Uh, for average, by any sane, this willingness to pay by uh, fuel distributors to invest in biomethane to avoid having to buy additional uh, advanced biodiesel, for instance, is at least 100 and something uh, euro per megawatt hour, which is more or less the price of the biomethane itself. And it can be much more if you have uh, uh, biomethane that is more efficient uh, because it has, in terms of JG content, thanks to uh, manure entrance. So you get really extremely attractive uh, price signals. It won't be all the biomethane that will take that price signal. It's of course, it will be shared between the different entrants. So there will be some obligation. But that's a real strong price signals that should allow emergence and answer to your question previous or previous questions. Yes, there is economic room to massively shift from LNG to bio-LNG in a rather quick fashion, as soon as this mechanism is in place. Um, and it will go far beyond, we, we speak about 10% uh, uh, obligation, let's say. It can be much more, because if, and that's a reasonable strategy, you choose to maximize your bio-LNG incorporation to avoid having to, bar to, to incorporate more expensive advanced biodiesel, then you will push your LNG fleet, uh, your deco decarbonization of the LNG supply, sorry, not fleet, supply, before the decarbonization of other fuel, which is precisely exactly what the Commission has in mind and has put the signal to have the most efficient transition. And Last but not least, we spoke about uh, infrastructure, and we had very good news uh, a few days ago. So ISCC has finally implemented regulation, implementing regulation of Red 3, allowing injected by a methane to be recognized and to be, by an equivalent principle, to be uh, recovered in uh, LNG terminals. Uh, one important point is that it's non-subsidized by emission that is allowed. Of course, there won't be uh, a double subsidies uh, allowed. So it means that we have to build new by emission plants to decarbonize maritime shipping. So we have a, a, a strong signal. We need to invest now. This is a message to all by emission developers and to fuel suppliers. Time to invest. Uh, it's especially competitive in France because in the way the regulation is written and it's transposed by ASCC, uh, the, the carbon content of electricity is taken into account. And so you have an advantage in France, which can be uh, eight euros compared to Rotterdam. This is uh, something that is not to be neglected. Uh, this is, we have seen uh, in here, I think, uh, in, a, in another, in another uh, conference here, we have spoken about physical bio-LNG. We should absolutely not oppose those two infrastructure way. There will be bio-LNG plants that are liquefied at the farm because it can make sense for various reasons. And it gives access to sites, especially to new potential of biomethane sites that cannot be connected to the grid and that without that solution will remain will remain uh, not exploited. So this bioenergy liquefied at the farm will be an additional way to decarbonize shipping. It will first be uh, dedicated to road transport or to track to ship uh, because it's e e to, to, to fill in uh, a large container ship, you would need 500 trucks lining on the on the jetty to, to fill in, so it's not working for very big ships, but to address uh, 
what uh, Thierry has said to, to, to come to smaller ships, this is a very relevant solution. Again, it has been said uh, before, when we are looking at the volumes, we have largely, largely in France, and that's an advantage of France again, uh, we will have more than enough biomethane to serve the maritime demand. Uh, again, the problem is not the size of the biomethane, the problem is the speed at which uh, LNG fleet will come to the French port and will be supplied in the French port. That will be the challenge. And what I say is that all this situation is a chance for France. We have to recover our sovereignty. Today, our fuel, our economy is dependent on other European ports. It's not fueled in France, mostly. We are completely dependent on our, on our neighbors. We have a chance not to say I do not want to be European, but still, this is something we need to uh, be sovereign and ensure that the French economy is supplied by at least some part of national solutions. Uh, and that's something that is really an opportunity for the whole uh, French industry, for the maritime industry in France. Thank you. Laurent, thank you very much. It sounds like a, um, it's a really exciting opportunity um, for the French um, fuel suppliers. Uh, do you see any um, any difficulty in meeting the 14.5%? I do not see. I do not see a difficulty. I am sure we won't make it. I mean, there is absolutely no way, practically no way, to reach this objective. We are in a situation where if you look at the figures, if we look at the investment that is required, we are not late. We are past being late. Uh, consider that globally this is so we don't yet know if it will be merged between road transport and maritime or if it will be two separated objectives. But let's say it's merged. At some point, uh, again, the bottleneck is gas mobility on electric mobility. But Whatever we do, there will still be a lot of diesel-powered mobility in 2030. And for diesel-powered mobility, we do not have advanced biodiesel available. We don't have e-diesel available by 2030. So what we can do to come the closest possible to minus 14.5 is to use at the maximum where we can decarbonize, that is to say, to switch maximum gas mobility to biogas, develop electricity where it's suitable, and uh, try it would be not too ludicrous compared to the objective uh, we have set ourselves. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the floor for uh, Saul Laurent? There's a question over there, please. Yes, Laurent, just for clarif clarification on uh, this uh, third sentence on this slide, when you say these guarantees of origin can be cancelled in LNG terminals to, to provide bio LNG to shipping, uh, the uh, two questions. First one, as from when? Uh, from today. Today? If you have unsubsidized biomethane. Okay. If you have subsidize biomethane. That's probably a discussion we need to have globally at, uh, at the level of the industry. Uh, the French state won't like it, but probably it's debatable, but probably uh, the directive is, is enough to allow that. We have to be extremely clear in the way we communicate with the French state of what we are trying to do, and also with uh, our customers to be very clear on what we are doing, to express that the goal is effectively to switch to unsubsidized biomethane, so that mobility is effectively decarbonized itself by its investment. That's what the government asks us, and that's given the mechanism has put in place, that's a fair claim. And so, yes, there is a period of transition, and we have to 
discuss and to have a clear pass for the time to 2026. Okay. And my second question, uh, when you say at the end to shipping, is it also available for uh, trucks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Same for trucks and for shipping. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? No, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, we'll move on to Casper. So, um, uh, so Casper Goren is the Carbon Zero Director at Titan LNG. Uh, he's got 15 years experience in renewable energy markets, uh, in European energy companies, renewable energy trading, and in various solar power scale-ups. At Titan, he works on bio-LNG bunkering and uh, liquefied biomethane supply projects. Over to you. Yeah, thank you to be here. Uh, I think I'm almost lost, so check if everybody is still uh, awake. Uh, I will keep it short. I will keep it uh, practical. And uh, uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's start a presentation here. Oh, that's not my presentation. Uh, can we? Uh, great. Yeah. Yeah, we heard, uh, I'll uh, just start off, uh, we heard uh, before from uh, uh, the different presentations from uh, Laurent, uh, uh, from Steve and also uh, this morning that uh, bio LNG is available, it is scalable and it's economically viable. Uh, and for us, uh, that is a very good message uh, because we are a shipping company uh, and our customers actually ask for solutions which are there right now. Uh, ha regulation starts kicking in uh, as of this year, as of 1 January, and uh, only becomes more stringent, as uh, we have seen uh, this morning. So, um, yeah, I'm going to tell you something about uh, uh, yeah, practical uh, use of bio-LNG in shipping. Um, yeah, basically, the, the perks of being speaking last is that uh, basically, a lot has al uh, already been said, so on uh, regulation, uh, I will skip uh, through that uh, very quickly and go to the, to the um, examples. Um, Titan, uh, we're uh, a bunkering uh, company out of uh, the Netherlands, uh, based in Amsterdam, uh, with uh, 45 uh, colleagues working uh, on delivering LNG and LBM to ships. We have uh, six bunker vessels chartered and of our own. So basically two uh, inland waterway barges and four seagoing uh, ships. And we deliver mainly to shipping. Uh, that's uh, in Europe mainly, but also with frequent operations in Asia and, uh, and America. Uh, but also deliver bio-LNG to, uh, to road transport and to uh, industry. Uh, our mission is to decarbonize uh, uh, mar marine fuels uh, by delivering bio-LNG right now and e-fuels in the future. Uh, that also includes, uh, for example, e-methanol. Um, yeah, I think we had it. Uh, this uh, picture basically has been shown already a couple of times. Uh, what we deliver LNG right now, delivering up to 20% uh, CO2 reduction to our customers uh, compared to fossil fuel, other fossil fuels right now. Uh, we're already blending in uh, bio LNG or LBM, uh, and we want to increase that further uh, uh, the coming years. Uh, I will go into that later. Uh, e LNG has been discussed. Uh, we see that coming within uh, five years uh, um, being economically viable. This picture has all, uh, also been shown. Uh, ha a lot of uh, LNG uh, ships in operation and ordered, more than 1,000. Uh, we like this picture because more uh, um, uh, LBV vessels are um, also necessary. Um, on the well-to-wake emissions, I'll skip this one because we already had this. Uh, basically, on the regulation, um, ha also mentioned by, uh, by Laurent, um, uh, RED3 is really important for us. Uh, but also um, ETS, uh, so the European Trading Scheme, which uh, kicks in uh, right now, and Fuel EU Maritime. Um, I would say had those are the most important uh, regulatory uh, questions we get also from our customers, which are, for example, big container liners, uh, car carriers, 
um, and they basically uh, want to have a product uh, which uh, yeah which is available for mainly for the European market uh, but also more and more uh, looking at uh, at IMO um, yeah we have more and more discussions also on the UK and US ETS so yeah uh, Europe kickstarted the discussions with the Fit for 55 package, uh, but we see uh, we see more uh, packages uh, coming worldwide. Uh, the role of bio LNG um, in ETS is still limited. Uh, uh, it is cheaper to buy an emission certificate right now uh, than you uh, than use bio LNG, uh, but it's the whole package. Uh, uh, one thing is ETS, but it's also uh, had decarbonization targets uh, within uh, your value chain. Uh, uh, for example, a shipping company uh, can uh, sell a green product to, for example, Amazon, and they're willing to pay a bit extra. Uh, so there's a voluntary market for it. Um, and also, uh, of course, the other uh, regulations uh, coming up, which will be more important, mainly on the uh, uh, well-to-tank side. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Laurent talked about uh, Menure. Uh, for example, Menure has a, has a negative uh, CI score uh, and there's a lot of potential to g gain additional value in the form of biofuel tickets uh, to also reduce the price of the bio LNG to our customers uh, because it's still at a higher price. Uh, but we see this, this voluntary uh, uh, prices the customer is willing to pay added up with the regulatory value uh, which can make it competitive also to uh, to LNG in the near future. And that's why uh, we're basically, every conversation we're having with our potential customers is on bio-LNG and not on LNG. Um, how do we offer it? Um, how we offer right now three kinds of products, which is a book and claim uh, biomethane certificate product. That is mainly a voluntary product. Um, ha sticking a certificate on your LNG, uh, uh, on your bunkered LNG. Uh, it has a limited value, more marketing value, uh, almost no, no, I would say no compliance value. And then we have mass balanced LBM. Laurent uh, explained uh, this. Uh, so basically, terminally, uh, terminal liquefied uh, bio LNG um, uh, that, is, uh, that has compliance and, uh, and marketing value and physical LBM uh, from small scale. Uh, local projects to uh, larger scale liquefaction uh, projects. Um, and yeah, from a portfolio perspective, we see our customers uh, interested in all, ha basically uh, from small scale, really uh, yeah, huggable projects uh, uh, for shipping. Uh, it's a bit too small, but have, uh, uh, let's say, one to two percent of, of these kind of uh, local cradle-to-cradle -cradle projects in your whole portfolio. Um, that is also nice for uh, PR purposes. Uh, from physical liquefaction, uh, it is more expensive, uh, but from a regulatory uh, side, it's always uh, compliant. Uh, and in regulation, the devil is in the details uh, uh, with the whole regulation developing in, in Europe. We don't know yet. So some customers say, uh, had this, uh, this is the safest product out there. We like to have some. We're agnostic and we're just uh, delivering demand and we see demand for all products uh, there. Um, also, basically a blend of LBM and LNG, but also a blend of these different types of certificates in LBM and LNG is possible and requested right now. So it's already getting a quite a complex field in, in such a new market and that makes uh, explaining it to our the customers really, really difficult uh, because they want just clear answers. Eh? Can I rubber, rubber stamp it for few EU? Unfortunately, uh, we are not able to do that uh, yet and uh, we need uh, yeah, some more regulatory clarity on that. Uh, some uh, real life examples. Uh, we, are we are investing in two projects. Uh, one is a really uh, small scale liquefaction project coming online in uh, in May June of this year, uh, we developed this together with Atero and Nordsol, um, where uh, six million uh, cube uh, of uh, local biogas is converted in uh, two and a half uh, kT, uh, two thousand four hundred ton of bio LNG. Um, and we are the long term off taker of this product. 
uh, yeah, we got a, a local s or a subsidy from the EU, uh, mainly for uh, CCU because that was not uh, uh, viable yet. Uh, so we produce 5,000 ton of CO2. Uh, the value in here is uh, we stick the the low CI, uh, the, the the carbon reduction of the CCU. We stick it to the bio LNG, and then it becomes a, a negative uh, bio LNG product, which can be sold. In, in markets where they also value uh, a, a lower CI product. Eh? Uh, Laura mentioned uh, Germany, for example, uh, but also in the Netherlands and uh, France, I understand, as of 26, uh, there's a, uh, th the market is valuing uh, negative CI scores. Um, have planned operation is, is already there. We still have some products, so if you're interested, uh, please uh, come to me. Um, ha this is small scale, ha uh, six, f uh, yeah, two, uh, 2,400 tons, we bunker that uh, uh, sometimes uh, at, at, at one go at a vessel. Uh, this is the year production. So for us, uh, uh, we need multiple solutions. Uh, one solution is mass balance product. Another solution is this project, uh, which we are uh, co-developing uh, with a, a biogas producer and uh, a launching customer uh, at our birth at uh, the Amsterdam site. Uh, we're planning to build uh, a 160 KTPA uh, liquefaction uh, plant um, uh, with local uh, produ uh, production. That we do that together with BioValue. They produce on-site uh, biomethane, uh, but also mass balanced uh, product from, uh, from Europe. And so getting it on the, uh, off the grid and liquefy it uh, over here. Uh, to have a yeah, physically liquefied uh, uh, product over there. Uh, some, some people say, yeah, uh, it's, it's really dumb to do because uh, it's more expensive. Uh, others say uh, uh, this is a product which is uh, yeah, always rubber stamped because it's, it's the best quality in this regulatory landscape. We want it. Uh, so in the end, we don't know where regulation uh, uh, is all heading. And uh, yeah, we think uh, this is, uh, is a good idea. Uh, and um, yeah, basically, um, and we need this kind of projects to reach skill. Uh, um, skill is necessary. Um, the whole biomethane to bio LNG uh, yeah, uh, value chain ca can be very competitive uh, compared to uh, methanol, com compared to ammonia. Uh, and um, yeah, later we can tie in ELNG. And the good thing here, for example, is uh, this will be connected to the local um, uh, uh, local uh, hydrogen uh, grid of the port of Amsterdam. And we have a lot of we produce a lot of bio CO2 here, so via methanation process, and we can get ELNG, which will be a nice uh, tie in uh, later when if uh, the whole H2 uh, um, production will happen. Um, yeah, I think oh, this uh, was already it. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Casper. Are there any questions over here from the audience? Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a little question about the WILP project. You said you can produce uh, with the, yeah, um, so liquefied uh, natural gas with negative emission because you capture the CO2, but this implies that you need to store it, right? Or, so wh what is the final, wh what do you do with the CO2 after you have captured yeah, it? Yeah, very good <laughs> question. Uh, we uh, want to deploy that at uh, local, local greenhouses. Uh, so, um, have putting it uh, in a greenhouse to uh, grow flowers, uh, which we have a lot in the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, is uh, still considered as CCU. Uh, um, so, we can account for the negative emissions. Ha another option we have is to uh, store it uh, in, um, uh, in a depleted uh, gas field, ha a CCS. In my view, that will, will be very would be very stupid to store bio CO2 uh, under the ground. 
But yeah. so you don't have a benefit to store it uh, rather than using it? Because, I mean, the CO2 is still at the end going out if you yeah. just use it, yeah. right? Yeah. But so le yeah. from a le legal point of view, it's the same? So uh, ICC, uh, we get it, ICC rubber stamped, uh, looks at the, the, the carbon is partially uh, used by the plants to grow and part partially also vented out. This process uh, still accounts for CCU, and uh, the negative emissions can be accounted for on, on the end product. This could change in the future, and we are also aware of that. Your next question is coming from the panel, Casper. It's not a question, it's about uh, the CO2 question. I think it's very important because CCS is gaining uh, enormous interest, and we are seeing, at least in France, this is the first way of decarbonization of France as a whole. It's the quickest way to decarbonize, and it's pushed extremely strongly by the state and will happen very quickly in huge volumes. And yes, probably uh, you will have, there is a sequence in the investment. So if you have biogenic CO2, probably the most intelligent thing is to reuse it probably as a fuel. When you re reuse it as a fuel, uh, yes, it's out in the atmosphere, but before being out in the atmosphere, you have produced the work. And this work is carbon neutral. So if you make the computation as a whole, it works. And the regulation are well done. The benefit is counted only once, not twice, so it's correct. Uh, but still, we are not yet there. We have seen all the difficulties producing E and hydrogen. So what are we going to do? Currently, ET it's not valorized under ETS. So if you look at the signals, either you do what Casper is doing, putting this bio CO2 in the ground to valorize the bio LNG, or if you count on the ETS, you put it in the air. Because currently, there is no other signal. If you have bio CO2 that is produced today by an industry, it's going in the air, and there is no incentive to capture it. Yeah, may maybe to add on there, uh, we want to... Uh, um, uh, there is, for example, a uh, nice uh, Dutch startup. It's called uh, Value Maritime to capture onboard CO2 emissions and uh, to make it a closed cycle um, and uh, use that uh, CO2 again in a methanation uh, process. Uh, so we're a bit far away there, but uh, there are uh, solutions at the horizon uh, to make it a short cycle. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in the end, uh, we also foresee uh, not only uh, uh, using uh, LNG uh, in our vessels, but uh, also transporting CO2. Uh, that will also be a uh, future business of us, uh, hopefully. <laughs> One more question in the audience. Thank you. Excuse me, eh? my English uh, is not uh, very good. Pas de problème. <laughs> bon, my, my question uh, is, uh, have you a possibility to work uh, with uh, sustainable aviation fuel for Titan certificate? Because uh, aviation fuel have uh, need a certificate of sustainable aviation fuel. Is it possibility to work? Is it of the sector? Thank you. Let me see if I understand it well to work together with uh, sustainable, uh, so soft producers uh, in, in, in order to decide where the, the uh, actually the molecule goes. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so, so I think in the end, I, I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, the hardest uh, the molecules will go to the hardest de to decarbonize sectors, uh, which are uh, sh uh, shipping and, and aviation. Uh, in the end, we are uh, diverging towards e-fuels, uh, which uh, Steve also uh, nicely pointed out in his, his presentation. So, yeah, I think there will be a competition between fuels, and uh, um, I think, yeah, in, in the end, so soft will have a bit of a higher incentive 
So uh, we, ha we will have big competition also from, uh, from SOF in my view. Uh, but in, uh, from that perspective, I think eFuse will also be er earlier uh, interesting for, uh, yeah, for SOF. That's great, thank you. Um, we're going to move on now. So thank you, Casper. Uh, our final speaker for today uh, is uh, Peter Triver, who um, is an engineer by training um, with a PhD from Erlangen-Nürnberg uh, and is now 